have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Hallelujah. In praying what to speak this morning, the Lord had directed me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to talk about a wife we're going to talk about a lady who became a mother. But there's some things that I just want to share this morning because when the Lord took me to 1 Samuel chapter 25, I said, well, she's not a mama yet, right? And so, but there are some things that God will begin to position you into even before you realize what he's going to do in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so if you know the story of 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're going to talk about a lady. Her name is Abigail. Say Abigail. Or Abby. Say Abby for short. And she has just a wonderful story that I want us all just to make, uh, make a mental note. Because sometimes when we talk about great ladies of the Bible, you know, we'll talk about Martha and we'll talk about Mary and they're the... Uh, La uh, Lazarus' sisters, and we talk about Mary, who's the mother of Jesus. We talk about De Deborah, who was a prophetess. Uh, but I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Abigail, but I think she has a story that we need to hear, we need to understand, because in what she did, she saved the kingdom. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can save your family. Turn to somebody else and say, you can save your family. I thank God, not just for the mothers, but I thank God for the women of God who are empowered to do things to save their family and to save their generations and to save all those that are connected to them. And sometimes when men fall, because sometimes men do fall, I thank God that God will send a strong woman in your life who's able to help carry you over places that you didn't think you could get over. Is this making sense to anybody? Thank God for all of the ladies. Thank God for all of the women and thank God for all of the mothers. And so I want to get into some things because I don't know if the ladies of God really understand the power that they really have. The power of influence, and the power of persuasion and the power of giving wisdom and the power of giving insight to people who really need it. Some of the best advice I ever got in my life did not come from my college professors who had PhDs. It didn't come from people that uh, I knew that were outside of my family. Some of the best advice I ever got came from my mama. And I thank God for having a pillar of wisdom and having the structure of knowledge that was close to me, someone that could whisper something in my ear and I would be able to hear it and thereby having another course in my life. Sometimes the right person in your life can give you the right wisdom at the right time and it will begin to steer you in a different course. It'll begin to steer you in a God course instead of your own course. Is this making sense? God has another level of trajectory that he wants you to be on. And sometimes we can't do it because we're down in low places. And God is saying, I want you up higher with me. So when I talk about ladies this morning, you have that type of influence. You have that type of wisdom. 
You have the ability to persuade people. Is this making sense? Men, I'll get to you in June, but this morning we're just talking to the ladies. We're just talking to the ladies. Is this making sense? The Bible says this. If you have 1 Samuel chapter 25, we'll read verses 1 through about 3, and we're going to read a lot out of 1 Samuel chapter 25, and I'll make some points along the way. The Bible says, 1 Samuel 25 verse 1, it says, And Samuel died. And all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose, it says, and went down to the wilderness of Paran. It says, and there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And the name of the man was Nabal. Say Nabal. It says, and the name of his wife, Abigail. Say Abigail. And the Bible says this, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doing. Churlish just means hard, hard hard-hearted. And evil in his doings, and he was of the house of of Caleb. And while we're standing, we'll have a quick word of prayer. Father, we just thank you today for being in your house today, God. We've come seeking you today. We've come seeking a fresh word for our lives today, oh God. We ask that the Holy Spirit would intervene in everything that's going on in our lives today, oh Lord. We just thank you for the preaching of the word, for the teaching of the word today, God. God, even now, it's no more I, but the Christ that lives within me today, God. We thank you today that you have a blessing for your people today, God. We thank you today that we'll be better when we leave than when we came into this place today, God. We thank you that with uplifted hands, we give you praise today, O Lord. With the fruit of our lips, we give you worship today, O God, because you are worthy of everything that goes on today. God, we cry out and decree that blessings be upon those who call on the name of the Lord today, God. We thank you for all of the mothers that are represented in this place. We thank you for all the soon-to-be mothers that are represented in this place today, God. We thank you for all of the ladies, all of the women who will take up the call to do what you have called them to do today, God. To be leaders, to be generals in your army today, Lord. To be able to give wisdom and knowledge and understanding today, oh God. And even now, for all of the mothers we ask that they be godly mothers lord and we just thank you for all that you're doing as the word goes forth today we ask that it will hit the hearts and minds of those who are here causing increase in their lives some 30 some 60 some 100 fold in jesus name we pray amen you may take your seat turn to somebody and say are you an empowered woman say are you an empowered woman Some of y'all were looking at some men, and so they're not going to be an empowered woman, but they're going to be an empowered man. Amen? And so the Bible says this. Let me stick to my notes. Let me stick to my notes. So the story of Abigail is a great account of what God can do in the life of an empowered woman. And before I go too deep into Scripture this morning, I want you to know that God has empowered you. But he's empowered you to make a difference in those that are around you. He just didn't empower you just to empower you. He's empowered you for the influence that he's called for you. Amen? Wives, I want you to know that your power doesn't come from your husband. Mothers, I want you to know that your power doesn't come from your children. Your power comes from God. Say, I am empowered. And so as we'll learn this morning, God is using Abigail to deliver everyone around her. And her story echoes in the hearts of all women and mothers as an example of courage and submission and quick thinking and being even tempered because she's able to handle situations much better than her husband. Amen. All of the wives said, Amen. And so Abigail has been empowered by God to save a kingdom. It started out just by saving her own household. But sometimes you don't even know the purpose and the destiny that God really has for you. All you know is what he's asked you to do at this time. 
And the things that he'll ask you to do at this time are laying the groundwork for ultimately what he wants to do in your life forever. Is this making sense? And so the Bible says in verse one, it says, and Samuel died and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house of Ramah and David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And so the thing I want you to understand is that Samuel died and then David arose. Say Samuel died, David arose. And so what we have is like a changing of the guard. We have transitions that are occurring even before our eyes. And so Samuel has left the scene. The Bible says, and all the Israelites were gathered together. They lamented him. So they went through their days of mourning. Uh, they buried him in the house of Ramah. It says, and David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Verse two, it says, and there is a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. It says, and the man was very great. Say great. In the NIV, it says he was rich. And it goes on to say he was rich because he had 3,000 sheep. He had 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Say rich. Sometimes you can be rich, but you only are rich with regard to finances. And you aren't rich with regard to character. So, so there are different ways to be rich. Rich. How many know that to be financially rich is one of the least, the basis of, of being rich? And so when God says, I want you to be rich, it includes money, but it includes a lot more than money. He wants you to be rich in having a good attitude, and he wants you to be rich in having character. He wants you to be rich in having integrity. And so we were here Wednesday night, and that was the, the gist of, of our lesson was character and how much it's important to us that we strive for character more than money. And so the Bible says that Nabal was very rich. The only problem is his riches had him. The problem that people have when they stop being poor and become rich is that they have a tendency that their riches have them. If you thought your life was hard when you didn't have money, wait until you get some. And your cousins start calling and your sisters start calling and kinfolk start calling because you're the first one up. And so the first one up gets all of the calls. And then you have to deal with this thing called pride that says, I got a little something now. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Oh, it's going to be tight in here today, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so my first point is Abigail's headstrong husband. Say Abigail's headstrong husband. And so Nabal is rich. The Bible says that he has 3,000 sheep and he's got all kinds of goats and they're out shearing the sheep. And so put up verse two for me, because the Bible says this. It says, and the man was very great and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And just so we're all on the same page, shearing is the process when, um, when the shepherds got together and they began to cut the wool off of the sheep because the wool would grow and it would make the sheep heavy. And also the wool was a place where insects would come and they would hide. And so every now and then the shepherds would begin to shear the sheep and they would begin to stack the wool up. And actually it was a day of celebration. You know, because, and in that wool, sometimes they would tie them into textiles and sometimes it would be dyed and this is what they made their clothes from. Wool, say wool. And so shearing of the sheep for the shepherd was equivalent to the harvest for the farmer. So when it was harvest time, everybody was happy, right? Because they're going out, they're cutting down their crops. There's plenty to give away. There's a lot to store. And so the same way with the rancher and the sheep, because now they're shearing all of the wool. They got excess. And you know what? In some, they could give away. And when they were shearing the sheep, normally they had parties. Because it was a time of celebration. 
And the Bible says that Nabal had 3,000 sheep. He had 1,000 goats, and he's shearing his sheep in Carmel. And remember, the Bible opens up by saying that Samuel had died. David arose, and he went down to the wilderness of Paran. And the wilderness of Paran is vast, and in there is Carmel. So David begins to see all of Nabal's servants shearing the sheep. Verse 3. It says, and the name of the man was Nabal. Say Nabal. Nabal in Hebrew means fool. Say foolish. It means fool. It means to be foolish, to be disgraceful, to be dishonorable. And it literally, it means to fade away. Because how many know if you are a fool for too long, you will eventually If you are a fool and you have money, you know what happens to the money eventually? It fades away. If you have a good wife and you want to be a fool, do you know what happens to the good wife? Y'all want to talk to me this morning. If you have a good husband and you want to be foolish, do you know what happens to the... I'm talking about to the best of husbands. They tend to... And the Bible says... (laughs) It says, and the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. And notice notice this comparison here because God is trying to show us something. So she's beautiful. She has a good understanding. It says, but he's churlish and he's evil. Turn to your neighbor and say, how do Abigail's end up with Nabal's? I'll let that resonate in, in, in your spirit. How did the good girls end up with the bad boys? How did the beautiful, educated, understanding women who go to God end up with someone who's churlish and evil? Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. You end up with foolish. The Bible says one of the signs of a fool is that they believe that there is no No God. And so how do all the church girls end up with people who don't even believe in a God? Oh, it's going to get heavy. You're like, I came out here for Mother's Day for this. Yes, you did. Yes, yes, you did. Because I want you better when you leave. Especially if you're talking about raising children. Because if you're talking about raising children, you don't need to be with a fool. Say a fool. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. And one of the, one when you look up uh, the Hebrew word for Caleb, it means dog. It means that sometimes in a good way and a bad way, that when, you know, when a dog clamps down on something, they ain't letting go. And in a good sense, it's good. But if you're clamping down on a bad thing and you won't let go, even though people give you good advice, it's not good. It's not good. Is this making sense to anybody? So so the Bible says he was a great man. He had all the sheep. He had all these goats. He's shearing the sheep. The Bible says they're in the wilderness. The Bible says in verse 2 that David arose and went down to the wilderness. And David and his men are in the wilderness because they're running from King Saul. So, So their paths cross. But it's not a coincidence. It's a God thing. And so David and his men, 600 men, are in the wilderness and they begin to see Nabal's servants shearing the sheep. And they also begin to see the Philistines that will come and all of the robbers and all of the marauders that that traveled in the wilderness looking to rob people. It's just making sense. And what eventually happens is David begins to protect the servants of Nabal from all of the robbers that come through wanting to rob the sheep. Does this make sense? Say robbers. Y'all looking at me like y'all don't know what, 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 what a robber is or a marauder is. So, so, so let me give you an example. I, I was born and raised in North Highlands. Anyone know North Highlands? North Highlands. And so uh, when my parents allowed us, and they eventually stopped us, but when they allowed us to do uh, go trick-or-treating, me and my friends, we were eight or nine at the time, we had our bags and we would go up and down the neighborhoods, but there were older kids in the neighborhood. They wanted the candy, but they didn't want to trick or treat. So they would wait on us 
to go through the neighborhood and then they would chase us. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So we would run down all the neighborhoods with, with our candy bags, knocking on people's doors saying, not only trick or treat, but hey, they're, they're behind me. And, and that's what a robbery is. <laughs> Taking something that does not belong to them. Say, thank God for protection. So, so David and his men begin to protect Nabal's men, and the Bible says this in verse 4. It says, And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep, verse 5, and David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity. Notice this. He said, I want you to go and talk to him because he's living in prosperity. I see he's got all these goats out here. They're having a great festival. He said, peace be both to thee, peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. Verse 7, and now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them all the while. They were in Carmel. So he said, take this word to Nabal that when we saw your shepherds and when, when the robbers came, we stood up and said, no, 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 that ain't right. And the Bible says this, verse 8, ask thy young men and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thy eyes, for we come in a good day. He's like, this is a day of celebration, meaning we're not asking you to do anything that we don't think that you can do, but by the mere fact that we help to protect your people, that you didn't lose one sheep that ought to be something that you ought to say, hey, hey, David, let me go ahead and bless you. So David says, I pray thee whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. Meaning they said what David told them to say and then they stopped talking. But notice this, verse 10, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David? Isn't it something how you can help people out and then when it comes time for them to help you out, they ask, who is he? Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? And this is how you know he's foolish and he's ignorant because he says, who's David? And then he asks, who is his daddy? Which means he already knew who David was. It says, there may be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He's like, David is a rebel. He's out here. And so I don't know why he's coming to me. Verse 11, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? He's like, I don't even know him. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. Say foolish. Say foolish. What he did not know is that David got mad. And he said to his being, strap up. <laughs> he said, lock and load. Oh, we... we, we. <laughs> He said, we're getting ready to go in and we're going to totally pillage Nabal. And the Bible says this, everyone that, that can I use King James Version on you? <laughs> King James Version says, everyone that pisseth on the wall, which, which means all of the boys. So he said, I'm going in after all of the men and after your entire future, your lineage, everyone that uses, that urinates on the wall. He said, we're going after everybody simply because Nabal was foolish and did not have an open heart to give him what he readily had available. This is making sense. So David's men turned and went again and told David all of this. David got mad. Say, Nabal is a fool. And this is the thing about fools is that sometimes... People are foolish, and then sometimes people are fools. I stand here today as a self 
self-confessing, self-proclaiming person who at times acts like a fool. If my wife, can, can, you, can you say like, yes, yes. There, there have been times that I have, act, not that I am one most of the time, but I have on occasions acted like a fool. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Can I share something with you? We hadn't been married for too long, and, and Tarsha and I were in, it was our first house. It was kind of smaller, and we were in our little kitchen area, and then we moved out to the dining room area, and she's going to remember this when I start sharing it. And we were getting ready to make breakfast. She was making breakfast. She had some eggs, and we had um, some uh, bologna, also known as bologna. Yeah, my, my bologna has a first name, O-S-C-A-R. But the bologna, when she pulled it out, it was kind of green around the edges, you, you remember. And, and, and she threw it away. And I said, oh, money is tight around here. We just don't throw food away like that. So I dug in the trash, say foolish, pulled out the bologna, washed it off, put it in the skillet. It, it stunk up the whole kitchen. And I had the audacity, I put a part on my plate, I put some on her plate, and she's like, oh no, oh no, 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 no. So, so I ate it, but then I had to go ahead and throw it, throw it, throw it away. Say, throw it away. But you know, fools do things just to prove points. Not that they're right all the time. Because fools just want to prove a point and to be right even when they're have you ever been wrong and someone told you what was right, but in order to prove your point, you still wanted to be wrong? That was. They're giving you good advice. They're giving you good wisdom, but you got to stand your ground. That's an example of a fool. And this is who Abigail, who has good understanding, and she is as beautiful as you want to be, and she ends up with Nabal. Is this making sense? Y'all don't want to say man. And so we'll go from Abigail's headstrong husband to Abigail's household history. Say household history. The Bible says this. Go with me down to verse 17, 1 Samuel 25. Verse 17, it says, now, there, now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master. So what happens is that Abigail begins to find out what David's servants told the servants of Nabal, and she also understands what Nabal has told his servants to go back and tell David and his servants. She also learns that, Nate, that David and his men are getting ready to come and take over, and they're getting ready to go to war. Verse 17, it says, Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. That's her too. It says, For he is such a son of Belial, notice this, that a man cannot speak to him. This is a sign of a fool. When people say like, I can't even talk to you. When I talk to you, it's like talking to a brick wall. When, when I talk to you, all of your defense mechanisms go up. When I talk to you and I give you sound advice, you don't want to hear it. When I talk to you about the things of God, you don't want to hear it. Even though your world is going down faster than you want it to go down, God sent me here to give you advice and you don't want to take it. So notice this. So the servants, they didn't even go to Nabal. They went to Abigail and said, hey, we got a problem in the household. If you can do anything, help us because it affects you too. Why is that? Because they couldn't go to Nabal. For all of the hard-hearted men, and you wonder why the kids go talk to mama. Why don't y'all call me? Why, why, don't you, why don't you text me? They don't have the courage to tell you. Daddy, sometimes you act like... 
When we come to you talking about our problems, you don't get emotional. You, don't, you just want to solve it. You don't want to listen to me. You don't want to encourage me. So that's why we got to go to mama. That's, that's why we're going to Abigail. Think about this. Nabal, who is the husband, he's over everything. He has servants at his disposal. The Bible says he's rich. He's got 3,000 sheep. He's got 1,000 goats, but he has no relationship with people who work with him. And he has no relationship really with his wife because she was one of the people who could not talk to him either. Turn to your neighbor and say, is he talking about you? There's nothing more frustrating than trying to give common sense, godly advice to people who don't want to take it. The Lord sends you in and says, you know what? He sent me with a stopper. I can fix this hole in your boat. All you got to let me do is do this. Instead of taking the stopper, they get out of drill and drill another hole. At some point, you got to say, I'm getting out this boat. Because it's going, yeah, with all of the cartoons, bloop, 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 bloop. It's going. See, foolish and navel are one and the same. That's why if you aren't careful, if you act foolish, it gets away from you. It gets away from you. So Abigail's dealing with a headstrong husband, and then she's also dealing with a household history. The history is the fact that nobody could talk to him. He's the type of person that when you told him the truth, he wouldn't talk to you for six months because he's giving you the silent treatment. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me in here. You can have fun when you leave here, but today we're talking business. We're talking God's business. And so say Abigail's headstrong husband. Say Abigail's household history. <laughs> My third point is Abigail's hopeful haste. The Bible says, verse 18, then Abigail made <laughs> haste. Notice this. She took 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep ready to, to be dressed, five measures of parched corn and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on the asses. Notice this. Once she found out that trouble was coming her way, even though her stubborn husband didn't do anything about it, she said, I've got to do something for the household for which I'm one of them. And we've got people that live in our household and they got sons and they got daughters. And just because he's ignorant, my grandma would say ignorant, <laughs> we can't let all of our whole household go down because he wants to be stubborn. This also so says something about Nabal's, his richness. That once she hears it, go back. She got 200 loaves just like that. Two bottles of wine just like that. Five sheep ready dressed just like that. Five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of grapes. She had all of this just like we need this and we need it now which is something that Nabal could have did just as easy. So she gets all of this as a peace offering to go talk to David. Say haste. She says, if I could get to David and talk to him, we can have a chance. Isn't it something when you're in a household and there are a delineation of roles and and sometimes when the husband doesn't do his role, then the wife has to do his role. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And someone has to do something so that the household is blessed. Because you have kids. You have a generation. You have a lineage that both of you should want to invest in. So we can't let the household go down just because I want to be stubborn. We can't let the household go down simply because I don't want to be, I don't want to use wisdom. 
I don't want to use discretion. I don't want to say I'm sorry. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And we have counseled people and they got to the point they didn't want to say they're sorry. And I'm like, what can we do in this situation? Because you know what the scripture says. And you look at their lives spiritually and they go down and it's going down and it's going down. And I can't tell you, you, I don't know about your life. I do know this, that our lives, our marriage got better when one of us said, I'm sorry. It's, it's easy. Practice it with me. Say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Your life will get better if you could use those phrases a little bit more. Oh, it got quiet in here. It got quiet in here. <laughs> what Abigail says is, if I can make it to David with the offering in my hand, and if I'm able to talk to him, I have a chance to save our household. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but my advice to you would be to get your corn Get your figs, get your raisins, and you need to go talk to the king. She didn't realize that she was talking to the future king, although the prophecy had already been out there. But she said, if I can just go talk to this man about my man, then maybe we can save all of some men back in the town. And so God wants you to get your praise. He wants you to get your worship. He wants you to get your character back. He wants you to get your honor. And he wants you to go meet him for the saving of your household. You're like, well, I don't know if I can do that because I might have to admit this and I might have to admit that. No, that's why she came with an offering. The next time you have a quiet time with God, you need to bring your offering. You, you need to bring a little bit of praise with you and you need to bring a little bit of worship with you and you need to go in there and you need to clap your hands a little bit and you need to stomp your feet a little bit and you say, God, I don't know what's going on and, and I'm doing some things because of decisions that have been made that I didn't even make the decision, but, but for the saving of the household, I want to say, God, I still love you. God, you're still more than the whole world to me. God, I know that if I can just get in your presence, the Bible says there's fullness of joy. And so what I'm wanting to do is I want to come with an offering. I want to come with some praise and I want you to hear what I've got to say. But some of us, even though we have praise, we don't want to bring praise. Nabal had a lot, but he didn't want to give a lot. In fact, he didn't want to give anything. The Bible says that sometimes you will have to give a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes you praise him when you don't feel like praising him, but you praise him even when you don't feel like you're praising him because you know to do the contrary would be foolish. I'll let that sink in. That when I don't feel like praising him, I'm not going to be foolish enough not to praise him because he's been too good to me. Remember, they're talking wealth. They're talking riches. They're talking thousands of sheep and a thousand goats. And so God has been good to them. Even if Nabal did not want to say it or not. God was good to them. Wherever you're living, if you are living, God has been good to you. Even living with a fool, God has been good to you. Oh, this is good. This is good. Say, I'm going to the king. The Bible says in verse 20, it says, And it was so as she rode on the ass that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. So she went so far, and then she just waited on them to come. God is saying, will you meet me at least halfway? Well, will you go and just wait on me until I come? 
Will, will you go for the saving of your household? Will you do what other people in the household won't do for the saving of your household? Is this making sense to anybody? So you're like, well, my, my whole family does that and my mama did that. And this. No, no, no. For the saving of your household, God may ask you to do something that's contrary to what everybody in your household has done. He may tell you, I want you to meet me. Is this making sense? If you would have asked me before June of 2019 if I would have ever saw myself pastor in a church and I would not have been alongside my dad, I would have told you you're crazy. Until God told me otherwise. Is this making sense? And at the end of the day, you have to do what God is calling you to do. Say, I can only be responsible for me. But we spend a lot of time being responsible for other people. She's meeting David because she's trying to say what he said, we don't really believe what he, she's covering for him. Have you ever seen wives that cover for husbands? Y'all don't want to talk to me. Ha, ha, have you ever seen husbands that cover for wives and, and, and then you see them at the Christmas party one year and she acts a fool and then you see them there the next year and she ain't there? Y'all don't want to talk to me. And you know why she wasn't there this year? It's not that they got a divorce. It's that like they had a conversation about you can't come and embarrass me. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. When I was reading the story, something dawned on me that hadn't dawned on me before because I've read this story. Uh, you know, if you read your Bible every year, you're going to read this story. And Abigail is married to Nabal, who is a fool. But notice this. She went out to meet David, who's acting like. A fool. The reason David was coming is because he was mad. Because he had been dissed. He didn't get his respect. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, so he's hot and he's hot headed. Is this making sense? And so now he's coming because he's mad. And, and she's leaving someone who's a fool. And ha have you ever just kind of been in between people who are acting? Y'all don't want to talk to me. Because Nabal may not just be a husband. Nabal may be a wife. Since we're here on Mother's Day, Nabal may be your son. Nabal may be your daughter. Nabal may be your in-laws who keep giving you bad advice. And you get mad about it. Is this making sense? You get upset about it. Why do people get upset when people give them good advice? Is this making sense? Why does that happen? The Bible says this in verse 23, and I'm going to be done. It says, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. The first thing she says is, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. <laughs> Nabal is his name and folly is with him, but I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of the Lord whom thy sent. She said, if they would have came to me, we could have had all of this taken care of. She meets David and she says, you know what? What he did, put it on my account. I'm sorry for him. I'm sorry for the household. I'm sorry for everything that happened. Please accept this offering. 
for everything that he did, everything that we've done wrong. When the shearers were out there, I just want to thank you for protecting them. I want to thank you for rising up against all of our enemies. And if he didn't have the audacity and the courage to say thank you, then I just want to say thank you. Sometimes all it takes is a thank you. And then she says this, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 28, she says, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. So, so not only does she have humility, but then she also has honor. Sometimes it takes someone just to remind you of who you are. She said, David, what you're about to do, you don't really want to do this. Because it's going to be a scar on your lineage. She said, you're too much of a king to do this. She said, yeah, I know he was wrong, but, but she says, don't do this because it's going to scar your reputation. Have you ever been about to do something that was wrong and someone said, hey, no, you, you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do Be, Before you hit send to that email you're about to send, ho, ho, let me read it. No, you, you don't want to use that word. You don't want to use that phrase. You, no, matter of fact, that, just, just go ahead. Don't even, don't even send that. You can vent to me. Vent to me, but please don't send that email because where God has taken you, you don't need this email chain following you. Is that making sense to anybody? That, that where God wants to elevate you, you don't want this in the background. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're too much of a king. So, so she says, man, where God has taken you, don't, don't do this. Now, first of all, she's saving her household. But notice this. Not only is she saving her household, she's saving his destiny. Because if there is any person that God would have really gotten after for doing something stupid, it was going to be the king. Remember, he's the one who slept with Bathsheba and went about nine months without saying anything. But God saw it. And the Bible says that God sent the prophet to say, hey, hey, we still got a problem here, bro. So, so she's saying, don't do this, man. I know you're hot headed. I know you're temperamental. I know that you're moody. And I know he did something that was not right. But there has to be a kingly way that you respond. There has to be a better way than going to fisticuffs. Y'all don't want to talk to me. At the grocery store, there's got to be a way than cursing one another out. <laughs> at, 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 driving down the street, there has to be a better way of handling it instead of giving each other the finger. With crosses on your back windshield. There's got to be a better way because, because, oh, I thank God for good women in your life. It's one of the things that my wife tells me all the time, like, whoa, 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 where God is getting ready to take you. <laughs> Don't have these people in Wendy's talking about he was the worst customer we ever had. No, 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 no. She's like, hey, if they don't have, if they don't have that chocolate shake, just, well, I'll take you to Brahms. I'll, I'll take you somewhere else. It, it's not worth it. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Because when people don't know you, it's okay. But when they do know you and then they associate the new, the you they see now versus the, 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 the you they saw back in the day, it's not going to be good. And she says, I love him even though he's a fool. But the bigger picture is, see, people with wisdom, they're always able to see the bigger, the bigger picture. They're, they're able to see the bigger picture with all of the details. They're, they're able to see like, sometimes people are able to see where you're going even before you know where you're going. How many parents do I have in here today? And, 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 and how many sons and daughters of parents do I have in here today? That should be everybody raising your hand in here. Your parents in some cases were able to see where you were going even before you knew where you were going. And that's why they said, no, you can't do that. So, so the Bible says this, verse 28, it says, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. She said, where God has taken you, he's going to make you a sure house. 
God told the prophet Samuel to anoint David to be king. And he said, I will bless your household. Notice this, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. She said, because you step out in what God has called you to do. It says, an evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. So she said, don't start this stuff now. Is this making sense? Verse 29, it says, yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. She says, even though people are after you now, God has got you bundled next to his heart. It says, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And then she begins to use language that David's very familiar with. <laughs> she, she, she knows how to bring him all the way back down because when you start talking about slings, if he didn't hear anything else, he's like, oh, 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 oh. Because she's like, God's got you. He's always protected you. He's always going to be with you. And when someone else comes, she says, God is the one who will throw the sling out. She said, what you're thinking about doing to Nabal, and he's my husband, don't worry about it. Don't do this to yourself. Does this make sense? Can I be real this morning? <laughs> because for, for all of the fathers who have fallen short and the mothers that have the ability to come through when people fall short, we just applaud you this morning. There are times that my wife thought she was raising two kids and realized she was raising. And y'all will figure out who the third kid is when you, when, when you get home. Uh, can I get an amen in the house? And you're like, okay, uh, well, he's sitting next to me. So just keep looking straight and nobody will know it's him. Well, I got more, but I got to stop. I'm stopping. We'll stand on our feet. Oh, it's good. Can you put up verse 30? No. Okay. Let me tell you this. You, this is your assignment. You can go home tonight and you can read this yourself in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Abigail has this conversation with David and she persuades him not to do what he was thinking about doing. She goes home and finds Nabal drunk and she waits until the next morning to tell him what she had done. And within two weeks, Nabal died. She ends up marrying David. And she wasn't a mother then, but she and David end up having a baby later. But she had maternal instincts even before she had a baby. And this is why I wanted to start this morning just talking to all of the ladies and all of the women because some have children, some don't have children, but you have those maternal instincts already on the inside. God has empowered you to save your household. Because if you're with someone who is stubborn, someone who's obstinate, someone who wants to be right or to prove a point instead of being right, God may empower you to do something that's out of the box. What's out of the box? That she gets all of the, the, the things that she brought and she goes to meet David herself. Realizing that David won't treat her the way he was going to treat her husband. Does this make sense? Sometimes you can get through doors that people close to you, even your spouse, 
can't get through. And it goes for the saving of the household. The reason I love this story is because I can identify with having a good wife, having a good mother, having a good mother-in-law, people that speak into your life and save you from doing foolish, stupid stuff. Things that you will regret at some point in the future. Is this making sense? Things that even though you say I'm sorry, you can't take back what's already been said. You can't undo what has been done. The only thing you can do is now continue to sow good word after bad word. Is this making sense? For all of the people who said they've been delivered from cursing and you still, you might drop one every now and then. For all of the people who said they, you've been delivered from this and before you know it, you're doing what you said you had been delivered from. And the bigger picture this morning is that if you do have kids, your kids are watching you. Maybe that's why God allowed David and Abigail to have children where Nabal and Abigail didn't have children. Does this make it sense? Sometimes we have children and we're not ready to be parents. Uh-oh. Not that you can't learn to be, but sometimes you, you should want to put your life in God's hands. Is this making sense? Today, this is a Mother's Day call to come higher. This is a Mother's Day call to say you can live a little bit higher in front of your children. That you can do a little bit better than what you've been doing because God will put it on your heart and he will empower you to change your household. At the end of the day, every mother in here should want your children to do better than you. The way that happens is that you give them all that you have so that they start a whole lot higher in life than you. You can't be the person who's jealous of your kids. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I, I've just been around too long and, I, and I've seen parents that are jealous and envious of their kids and like, well, I didn't graduate from college. Well, you ought to be thankful that I did because I've come from your womb from your lineage is only going to bless you the Bible says in the Pro in Proverbs chapter 31 that, that if you have a, if you are a virtuous woman it says that your children will rise up and call you blessed because you did a good job when your son acted like a neighbor, you still prayed for him. You still gave offering for him. You still laid your hands on him. You still blessed them. You still spoke positive life, a uh, positive word in their life. You still decreed and declared. When your daughter was living beneath where she was supposed to be, you still encouraged her. You still loved her. You still said, baby girl, it's gonna be all right. God will help you get your stuff together. Still anointed pillows when they didn't, they didn't even know the pillow was anointed. They just woke up and oil was on their face. The Bible says this, that we are able to speak a word of healing. You don't have to be in the same room. You can just speak it. That's the power that God has given parents that you're able to decree you're able to declare a word and you know what you're like I'm getting ready to see this word manifest it's getting ready to manifest you just can't be headstrong 
for the negative things in life. Today, make a decision. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be a better parent. I don't care how long you've been parenting. I made the decision to be a better parent when my kids were teenagers because they needed a better parent. They didn't need the parent that I was because, because how many know a teenager needs something more than a five-year-old? And a young adult needs something a little bit more than a teenager. So, so with every phase, you've got to say, I've got to do better too. Because at five years old, I can control their lives. But at 25, I want to. But I can't. So they need a little bit more wisdom, a little bit more guidance. And so now I send texts in the morning and family texts. And I'm just saying like, hey, how's everybody doing? And, 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 and praying that they're doing what they need to be doing. If you're here this morning, and that sermon resonated with you, just come down to the altar. I just want to pray. We're going to have an old-fashioned altar call this morning because when you leave here, I want you to be empowered by God to change your life, to change the life of those around you. And this is the key. You came down here saying, God, I want to be better and what you don't realize is that once you're better, you begin to change the life of a potential king that God may have you raising. Come a little bit closer. And just lift your hands. One of the most eye-opening and hurtful things that the Lord had ever whispered in my ear was to tell me, you gotta do better. You gotta be a better person. You have to be a better parent. You have to be a better husband. And I would say like, no, I'm doing the best I can, but God knows what he puts in you. And he wouldn't have told me I could be better if he knew I couldn't be better. So what he was asking from me was something he knew I could give, but I wanted to continue to be a neighbor. Because being a neighbor is easier than going higher with God. To act foolish is easier than applying yourself to learn wisdom. Lift your hands in here. When you leave here and you have kids, you're going to want them to say, Mama may not have been the richest. We may not have had all of the material things. But I knew that she loved me. She gave her heart for me. And there wasn't anything that I could not ask her that she would not do for me within reason. And even when I did not want to hear some of the things she told me, I am so glad today that my mom had the courage to say, slow down, boy. The night I came home drunk, my mama was like, boy, after I woke up the next day, you're like, what? Did he just say what I thought he said? Yeah, 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 yeah. Today, your life could change. Some of us think our mamas are old and old fogey and religious and this, that, and the other, and they just old-fashioned, and, and you know, I remember a candid conversation that I had with my kids, and I told them, I'm not old-fashioned, I'm just biblical. What, what, I, what I'm asking, I'm not asking you because I think that's the way that I think it should go. 
I'm just, I'm just trying to be biblical. And here's the deal, you can get in your word, I can get in my word, Tarsha can get in her word, we can call your grandparents, we can just find out, because if I'm wrong, I'll be the first one to say, I'm wrong. But as for me and my house, because when I get to heaven, being a parent, I want God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because I can't tell I, I, I know I can give good advice just like any parent and they can do good they can do bad but when I get to heaven I don't want him to say no you should have said this and you should have said that and you you went and buried your hand your head under the rug and no 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 lift your hands I want to pray because we are sending another generation out into the land some of you are here today because your parents have sent you out into the land and their prayer is still behind you. You don't even realize that they saw God hard about you. One thing about my mama, because my daddy was the preacher, but, 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 my mama could get a prayer through. Not to say my daddy couldn't get a prayer through, but I know my mama could get a prayer through. Lift your hands. Father, we thank you for those who are here today, oh God. We thank you for the mothers. We thank you for the fathers. We thank you for the parents. Most of all, God, we thank you for the, the children today, oh God, that you have called us to steward today oh God we thank you today that you are giving us wisdom for every age and every stage today oh God we thank you that you are empowering us to be the greatest parents that we have ever been today oh God we thank you that when you speak to our hearts and you speak to our minds about what we need to give our children today God that we we readily adopt the new thing that you're giving us today, God. And we lay aside the old way today, God. And we thank you today that we're coming higher with you today, God, because our children need us. They need the new us. They need the new and improved us. They need the 2.0 us, God. And we just thank you today for releasing the old. We open our heart for the new. Thank you for an empowering spirit today Lord for each one who's here those who are looking online God we ask that you would bless us that you would keep us today God in Jesus name we pray amen give God hand praise in here thank you so much for tuning in today we really appreciate you supporting our broadcast and if you've never had an opportunity to join us in person if you're in the Oklahoma City area we want to invite you to Impact Community Church. We're located at 4400 Northwest Expressway in the Cole Community Center. We have something for everybody in your family. Bring your kids, bring the entire family. I know they will love Impact. If you would like to sow into Impact Community Church, you can give on our website by mail or text to give. The information is on the screen. Thank you for your support.